He is the man. Punch wears a pretty hat. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Oh, before we begin, I promise that Revolution of the Mask, issue number three, will be out soon. Anyway, people, I've been doing this for 30 years, so I suppose it's time to finally review Final Crisis. I was just put off after so many people ended up hating my Countdown to Final Crisis review that I just didn't want to get around to it, but of course it's time. As such, let's dig into Final Crisis number one. Whoopee! Right off the bat, you know you're in for something bad. This cover is just lazy. Look at the cover to Crisis on Infinite Earths number one, or even Infinite Crisis number one. There's a lot of stuff happening, giving you the impression of an epic crisis that will span the length of the DC Universe. But this? Huh, it looks like a Dean Koons novel that was phoned in by the artist. There's nothing epic about it. Two-thirds of the cover is wasted on the comic's title. And the image itself isn't all that... Oh, hey, I was wondering when you'd finally show up. What the? Where am I? You're in the future, about 30 years or so. Really? Where are my pants? It's time travel. Your clothes can't go with you. Oh. Then why am I still wearing my shirts? Um, uh, anyway, you'll be pulled back into your own time soon enough. It's just a residual effect of Dr. Insano playing around with hypertime. I see. Wait, why aren't you wearing my hat? What hat? And why are we here? You're saying in 30 years I never move out of my parents' house? You think it's bad for you? Clean your room! This is intolerable! When I get back to my own time, I'm gonna change things! I'm gonna make this all better! You'll see! I am gonna turn my life around, and all of this will... Hey! I got my hat back! I love them, and I know you all love them. You know who else loves them? Comic fans! While it's been fairly standard for a comic to feature characters from other stories in the same universe, crossovers with other companies were rare when they first started. In the 90s, though, they were all the rage. Marvel and DC produced some good, some bad, and these days you rarely see them, mostly because of the egos of the people in charge of the companies. But then there are crossovers that just don't make any sense. Was there anyone who was really asking to see Batman fight aliens or Predator? I mean, outside of that cool fan film? And who in their right mind decided Archie meets the Punisher needed to happen? Speaking of, no, I'm not reviewing that one, mostly because it isn't that bad. Really, these kind of crossovers just don't work, especially with characters like Superman. Keep that in mind as we dig into Superman vs. the Terminator number one. Now, it's actually called Superman vs. the Terminator, Death to the Future. I guess because they needed to distinguish it from Superman vs. the Terminator, Journey to Happy Land, or Superman vs. the Terminator, Vice City. We have this image of Superman surrounded by hundreds of Terminators with guns aimed at him, and while this is well drawn, he looks like he's only slightly agitated by the attacking robots. And why is it centered like this? Couldn't they have filled up the whole page instead of having this unnecessary border around it all? We open to Metropolis, where Sarah Connor and John Connor are continuing on the run from the Terminators. 
Yeah, don't bother trying to figure out where this fits into Terminator continuity. It'll just make your head hurt. All of a sudden, a naked man beams in. What is it, Mom? Our worst nightmare! It's another Terminator sequel! Run for your life! It's a Terminator! Wrong! You changed the future! Now I am a kindergarten copinator! The Terminator suddenly fires lasers out of its eyes. It, wait, what? When the hell could Terminators do that? And by the way, look at this guy's face. It's like they went out of their way to make sure he doesn't look a thing like Schwarzenegger. Sarah manages to get into a sporting goods store and grabs a flare gun, shooting a flare right at the Terminator. It melts off a good chunk of its face, but it's still going, all of a sudden loudly announcing how all of its systems are still operative. It's been a while since I watched the movies, but I don't recall Terminators being quite this chatty either. Superman, flying overhead, notices the commotion and the Terminator inside. People running out of that mall in panic! My god, they must be filming Jingle All The Way down there! I've got to stop them! The Terminator, somehow noticing Superman flying right at it, despite him going at incredible speeds, turns to try to fight, but Superman promptly sends his naked ass flying. Even after this, the Terminator can still fight and it shoots off another eye blast at Supes and punches him. Superman regains his senses and decides to end this before it can escalate any further. I guess I can take the kid gloves off! Because I am a moon! We already used it. Oh, I so did not use the joke last week! That didn't count! With that, Superman punches its head off and rips through the robot like it was tinfoil. Superman wonders what was going on and decides that asking the couple that was attacking could help. Wait, couple? Why does he think John Connor and his mom are a couple? Furthermore, when did he see them being attacked? He just spotted the Terminator rampaging around. He finds them in an alleyway preparing to leave Metropolis. While at first Sarah refuses Superman's help, he kindly picks them up and brings them to a construction site. Because that's the safe place to be when engaging in fights that create lots of debris. While you're under my protection, nothing or nobody will harm you. So long as those killer robots are made out of rocks, you'll be safe. So Sarah lays out the premise of the Terminator movies. Not very far into the future. We're down in our machines are going to rebel against us. The George Foreman grills are going to be the stormtroopers of the machine apocalypse. An artificial intelligence will control every computer, every electronic system in the world. And then we'll all be hooked up into an interactive simulation called the Matrix and... Oh, wait, wrong franchise. Only a tiny remnant of humanity will survive to fight back, led by my son, John Connor. Ugh. I see Christian Bale does not age well. Superman is skeptical of this at first, but he can't deny the evidence of the Terminator that tried to kill them. Sarah, however, is confused about how Skynet found them at all, since they'd been so careful to cover their tracks. John admits that, like a moron, he entered his name into a contest at that toy store to win a bike. Well, what the hell did he expect to come from that? He obviously couldn't put a home address down on the thing since he's on the move. And why did the Terminators decide just that very moment to attack? In the first movie, the Terminator just went around hunting for her. It didn't know where Sarah Connor was. Superman promises to find the entry and destroy it, but Sarah doesn't think the plan will work. Don't you see? You obviously won't destroy the entry, or the Terminator wouldn't have been able to pinpoint us like that. Wasn't the entire point of the first two films, the only two films that were out at the time this comic was made, by the way, that you could avert destiny? And by the way, you're trying to argue time travel physics to the man who perfected the Popemobile go-kart time machine during the Silver Age. He probably knows more about what he's talking about when it comes to alternate futures than you do, lady. Their conversation is interrupted, however, when two more not Schwarzeneggers arrive via time bubbles. If Skynet can send back more than one Terminator at a time, why not just send back 500 of the things all at once? It's the same thing with the Borg in Star Trek. Why not just send a hundred cubes to Earth to assimilate humanity instead of one at a time? I know you can argue efficiency and resources and all that, but the lesson works both with Star Trek and this comic. If you have the capability to do so, just friggin' do it and ensure victory instead of just wasting your time with the same strategy over and over. Meanwhile, the cyborg Superman, long story there, basically he's a Superman villain, blames Superman for all his problems, blah blah blah, has recovered the Terminator skull and is examining its technology. A pity its functions were destroyed by my hated enemy, Superman, but fortunate that I was able to retrieve it. Dude, get a blog. It's a lot easier than monologuing to yourself. It must have come from the future. Or, you know, someone smarter than you on the Earth. 
That must mean the existence of an advanced race of machines. Transformers, robots in disguise. They could be the answer to all my problems. Like how to turn a man witch into a meal. Long has that solution eluded me. The cyborg realizes he can use the Terminator skull to leave a message to Skynet in the future with information on how to defeat Superman. Though, really, I don't think it's necessary. If that future really was the legit future of the DC Universe, Skynet would already know all of Superman's weaknesses. It's not like his weaknesses are classified information. This does explain, though, why the Terminators have eye beams But then that just makes this into Superman vs. Robot guys who don't resemble Terminators but influenced by the cyborg Superman, not Superman vs. Terminator. Anyway, Supes engages the two naked robots, though really, this fight should be over in three seconds. All you need to do is fly really fast into them and punch big holes through them! This is why this concept is so idiotic! The two Terminators start throwing debris at innocent people to distract Supes, but he manages to stop it in time to smash them up with rocks. But I'm puzzled. Let's start from the beginning. How could they have known anything at all about me? Well, maybe if you weren't letting yourself be interviewed by Lois Lane every week, information about you wouldn't be widely available! Meanwhile, the cyborg plants the skull in a statue with a frequency for the machines to pick up on so they'll find it in the future. And, of course, all the while he narrates as if anybody cared. Back with soup, some sort of time storm starts up and envelops him. My powers don't work against it! Exactly what powers do you use against a time cyclone? Freeze breath? He heat visions into a metal beam Lois's phone number and tells them to contact her for help while he vanishes. As he time travels, his clothes rip up too, though I have no idea why. It's one of the stupider concepts of the Terminator series, that clothes can't travel back because only living tissue can go through it, which makes even less sense. They try to explain this by saying that he feels himself turned inside out, then back again. But that wouldn't mean his clothes would be shredded. That means he would be dead. He rematerializes in the future and is instantly mistaken for a Terminator by the Resistance. However, among them is John Henry Irons, a.k.a. Steel, and he tells them to hold their fire. And so our comic ends with Steel telling him that he's arrived in Metropolis in the year 2032, and we see it's become a twisted wasteland. This comic sucks! The art is good, but the crossover itself is a bad idea! It's poorly written, since if this is supposed to be the DC Universe, there are hundreds of heroes who could help counteract the machine-run future as well as Skynet. The idea that Skynet wouldn't know about Superman is stupid, and also that the Connors don't already recognize Superman as someone who can help them, is just idiotic if they're really supposed to share universes. A real Superman versus the Terminator fight would go more like this. I'll be back. No, you won't. Wham! Smash. End of story. All this hatred is embedded in the panels he is facing There's nothing but pure failure So he grabs his head and straightens his glasses And now he's ready to kick some comic ass I talk the fourth wall I talk the fourth wall I talk the fourth wall Moral. 